الحمد لله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدلل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته كيف حالكم جميعا يا أيها الأخوة وأخوات في الإسلام We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to come together this morning, bi'ithnillah, as a reminder, bi'ithnillah, to myself first and foremost and to you all, pertaining to a specific issue which is very rudimentary, very fundamental, very basic, but also it is extremely difficult for those whom Allah Jalla wa Ala has tested with nifaq hypocrisy and it is something that we need to be on guard for the rest of our entire lives since coming into al-islam and we cannot afford the opportunity to slack but before beginning be ithni left i like to remind I like to remind myself and to remind you all the importance. I like to remind myself and to remind you all the importance of to all their humbleness and recognizing in the beginning, which is known as the khutbah tahajah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the tongue of his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that tremendous sermon of need. And it's no doubt it's a sermon of need. Uh, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asks Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, recognizing a lot of things, he asks Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that we praise you and we seek your assistance. Without Allah Jalla Wa Ala we won't be able to do anything. We wouldn't be able to accomplish anything. We wouldn't be able to will anything. We wouldn't be able to do anything from any type of ibadat or anything outside of ibadat. Acts of worships, you would not be able to do it if you did not have Allah aid or help, okay? Also, he says, that we seek your forgiveness, which also let us know that we are prone to commit sin. We are prone to fall short. We are prone to make mistakes. We are not mistaking free or mistakes free. We're not error free. We're not someone who is ma'asum, all right? Which should always give us that humbling pill and that we should always remind that when we begin to judge each other or judge others or judge loved ones or judge spouses, we should always keep that at our forefront that we are deficient. This is why it's important that we constantly moist our tongue with begging Allah Azza wa Jal for his forgiveness. He also says, Recognizing that we have evil within our own selves, that we have evil that emanate within our thoughts within our heart, within our actions that leads to actions, that sometimes we think foul things or wicked things, or we want to do things that are not actually sanctioned by Allah Azza wa Jal, knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fully aware of what we think. But Allah Jalla wa is mer out of his mercy, he doesn't bring us account for those things that we think, which are evil, and we all have them. I don't care who you are. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal in multiple places in the book of Allah Azza wa Jal He mentioned فَإِذَا نَزَغَ الشَّيْطَانِ If the shaitan whisper to you an evil thought Then you should immediately The remedy for it is to seek refuge with Allah from the shaitan Because we all suffer from these thoughts or these insinuations Which should also show us that we need to be humble No Then he says that's just the evil from ourselves. That's just the evil from ourselves. Then he said the evil from our actions, what results of our actions, harming other individuals, harming people, with what we say out of our mouths, or what we do with our hands. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Man salim muslimun. He says the one who is actually, the, the, the one who other Muslims feel safe 
from his, what? Min lisanihi wa yadihi. Feel safe from his tongue and from his hands. Sometimes we don't think what we say out of our mouths actually has an effect on someone else. We don't really give two thoughts about that. Henceforth, we, in the mentality, we have the mentality of, I don't care what I say, I stand on that, so what? And that type of mentality that we have really is going to bite us because those words that you say out your mouth that can be evil or cause harm to someone else, you will be held accountable for those words unless you do the following. And this is why, look how the Prophet Sallam mentioned all of these things. We seek Allah forgiveness because we constantly would do that. Then after all of that, he mentioned how Allah Jalla is the only one who can guide us to do these actual things, to seek his forgiveness, to praise him, to seek his assistance, to actually recognize the evil from ourselves and our evil actions. This is the thing that only Allah Jalla has the ability to give us the guide. I wanted to mention that first. Tayyip, alhamdulillah, this is a brief reminder, hopefully not to be too long. I wanted to talk about an issue that sometimes a lot of us, when we fall short in our lives, especially when it comes to our Islam or our tatbiq of our Islam or applying Islam, a lot of us, we always sometimes go back and say, where did we went, where did we went wrong? Um, where are we making our mistakes? Where are we erring at? Why can't we get it right when it comes to our deen, right? And some people, you know, they ask questions. What should I begin with? Where should I start? How should I get back on track? If I felt off track, how do I get back on track? Well, that's what this talk is about today, inshallah. This morning, this talk will be about a reminder on how to get back on track. Whenever you find yourself going off the rails, so to speak, in Islam, then there is a gauge point. There is something that will always keep you centered within your deen. And it is a basic point that you need to have. And that is going to be your salat. You can always tell how strong you are with your deen in regards to how strong you are with your salat. All right, so we're gonna talk about salat today. And that's why we call it slay your five while you're still alive. Why? Because of the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, which is known as a hadith Qudsi, which is a sacred hadith on the authority of Abu Hurairah which is collected uh, at Tirmidhi in his Sunan. Shaykh Al-Abani said the hadith is to be, he graded the hadith to be Suhaid. He said about this hadith, he says, that it says, إِنَّ أَوَّلَ مَا يُحَاسَبُ بِهِ الْعَبْدُ يَوْمَ كِيَامَ صَلَاتُهُ He says that indeed the first thing that the servant will be brought to count for or taken account for in the Day of Judgment will be his prayer. فَإِنْ صَلَحَتْ فَقَادَ أَفْلَحَ وَأَنْجَحَ And if he is if his prayer is correct or sound, then he will be one who what? Who will be actually successful and one who will be saved. He will be victorious if his prayer is sound. He says, What in fasadat for called the khaba, huh? And if his prayer is deficient or is falling short within his prayer and is obligatory, then it's voluntary, etc. As it goes on to the hadith, he mentioned that he will be someone who will be what? Destroyed and someone who will be lost. All right, if that's the case, the first thing that the servant will be worth account from his deeds, from his actions on the day of judgment will be the prayer. And then he continues, he says, فَإِنِنْ تَقَصَ مِنْ فَرِيضَاتِهِ شَيْءٌ قَالَ رَبُّ عَزَّ وَجَلْ أُنْذُرُوا حَلْ لِعَبْدِي حَلْ لِعَبْدِي مِنْ تَطَوُّعٍ Okay, so then Allah Azza wa Jal, he says that if any deficiencies is found within his obligatory prayers, all right, meaning from Fajr to uh, Isha, then Allah Azza wa Jal says, he's going to say, look, he's going to tell the angels to look and see do my servant have anything from the voluntary prayers. So that it can actually complete that which he felt insufficient in within his obligatory prayers. All right, so Allah is going to use the voluntary prayers to patch up some of the holes in the obligatory prayers. And this is also from Allah's justice and also from Allah Jalla Fadl and Allah Jalla mercy. Continuing, the hadith goes on to state, then Allah is summa yakunu sa'iru amalihi ala that. Then this is how the rest of his actions will be judged based off of that. This is how the rest of his actions will be judged. It's a tremendous hadith. So the salat is a grave of grave importance. The next hadith I'm going to mention is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. It is mentioned in uh, the Muslim Ibn Ahmed. There's also another hadith with a different wording that is also mentioned uh, by Jabir ibn Abdullah and the Sahih Muslim, Sahih Muslim. Uh, the hadith, the first hadith is mentioned that it says, 
العهد الذي بيننا وبينهم الصلاة فمن تركها فقد كفر The Prophet ﷺ said that the covenant between us and them here the them is those who are the non-believers all right the covenant between us and them that thing would separate us to different, differentiate us from them is what the salat for men tarakaha and whoever leaves off the salat okay and many scholars have many scholars is, is, is a lot of scholarly debate back and forth over these two hadiths and this is not the time to go into that inshallah ta'ala you can that'd be a separate time or you can go as many uh Contemporary scholars, even scholars of our, of our times and the scholars in the past that talks about the issues of really what's meant or the maksu behind these hadiths. All right. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, whoever leaves it off, then indeed he have committed kufr. He have disbelief. All right. And the hadith that comes in Muslim, it says. Bain al-rajuli wa bain al-kufri wa bain al-shirki wa bain al-kufri tarak al-salat. All right, that between a man, يعني, meaning that between a man and shirk and disbelief is the abandonment of the prayer. All right, it's the abandonment of the prayer. So the prayer is our focal point. Whenever you find yourself off center in Islam, and, and, and it's easy for us to go off center, man. This world is, this world is what it is. And we got to stop, you know, we don't have to act like we got to be so high and mighty or that just because we have a certain Aqidah or we believe we, are, we affiliate ourselves to a certain Aqidah or we affiliate ourselves with certain things or we're around the brothers or we're around the sisters, you don't have to act that way. You're going to fall short. If you don't read the Quran, you wouldn't understand this. You're going to fall short. If you don't read the Hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, he told Abu Bakr as Siddiq, if you do not commit sins, I'm going to bring a nation that will commit sins. Do you not understand it? You, I'm not saying this is a license to commit sins. I'm saying you're going to fall short. You don't have to act as if you got to be perfect. It's not going to, you're not going to never reach that state in this dunya. It's not going to never happen. All right, wait, you please. Let me finish this. Is it what? Yeah, you're going to fall short constantly. So that's something, that's something that you must understand. You're going to fall short. Are you come here, please? I need you to shut that door. Come on. No, I need you to go in there and shut the door. Come on, hun. Already did it. Go ahead, please. While I'm, I'm here, I don't want to disturb me. You can go play that in there. No, you can go in there and play it. No, it's not quiet unless you want to turn it all the way down. You want to turn it all the way down? All Let me help you. Way. Yes, all the way down. No, I can't hear it. Exactly. Or go in here and you can hear it. I don't want to put it all the way down. Like all right, well then can you go in there, please? And let me get done? It's cold on there. All right, and then just cut it off. No, F1, F1, F1. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I gotta give I gotta give Ayub his hawk. <laughs> um anyway, yeah, mashallah. So at the end of the day, hadith, 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 hadith. No, so whoever leave it off, they have abandoned the salat. So we wanted to say that whenever you go off for else, and we're talking about sins, so you're not gonna be perfect, you're not gonna achieve that affection. So I just wanted to, to bring that out there for a minute. But one thing you don't wanna lose, and you will lose your your identity as a Muslim. I want you to understand what I'm saying. And this is something that I've been reflecting on daily as I go out to and fro, hustle and bustle, and especially in today's time that we live in. You will lose your identity. Yes, you will fall short, you will do this, you will do that. But your identity will be lost the moment you give up your prayer. That's something you can never give up. That's something you must constantly guard. And henceforth, Allah Jalla when he describes the prayer in the Quran, Notice he used the word hafidhu ala salawat. Those who guard. You understand? Those who preserve. You mean they guard their prayers because you have to guard them. This is something you want to have to do must boot. It's just like you're breathing. That's how we want to reach our prayer. Our prayer must be like our breathing. 
and then we want to reach the enjoyment of the prayer. Like the Prophet Wasallam said, nothing has been made a delight. The salah has been made qurra to ayn. Ayun has been made a delight, a delight to my eyes. It's been the apple of my eyes. You want to reach that state. In order for us to reach that state, to get to that high state, we have to begin to train our souls and our bodies to constantly pray. All right? Even if you don't know all of the surah in the Quran, even if you don't know all of this or that, it doesn't, that's not it. But constantly pray. Whether you're a male, whether you're a female, whether you're a husband, whether you're a wife, whether you're single, you have to constantly pray. You understand? This is important. You lose your Islam identity. You lose your defense if you don't pray. The, 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 the protection that you have is in your prayer. You understand? And the fact that because the prayer embodies thicker, it embodies the remembering Allah Azza wa Jalla. All right? It embodies the reciting the book of Allah Azza wa Jalla because you have to recite Quran in it. It embodies offering dua because you offer dua in it. It embodies seeking forgiveness because you seek istighfar in it. It embodies all of these things. So if you do it on a daily basis, some days you're going to fall short. Some days you might only get to get, uh, you know, get three prayers in on time. And you might get the other two a little bit delayed. Some days it's going to be like that. Some days you're going to get all five in on time. You're going to feel actually good. This is going to be the gauging matter for you. And if you want to know it, you're going to become an excellent Muslim, you're going to be excellent in guarding your prayer. That's how you're going to reach that stage. If you want to be a believer, then your obligatory prayers is on a beam. Do you not understand what I'm saying now? I don't want you to lose me. I'm not saying that you don't have Iman because you're a Muslim. I'm just telling you there's three different levels to Islam. It's Islam, right? Then it's Iman, and then it's Ihsan. So if you want to be a believer, and you want to get to that believer stage, then your obligatory prayers need to be on a beam. And what I mean by that is you constantly already got them down pat. So when you're praying the, the, the supererogatory prayers, then they're just becoming adi, like you are doing the obligatory prayers, all right? So that's what we want to get to by the permission of Allah Jalla wa ala. Um, I wanted to mention some words from uh, Sheikh Saleh Fuzan at the talk, Allah Ta'ala, on the issue of prayer. And hopefully we can end it with this. He reminds us beautifully, he says, Salat. What does it mean to establish the prayer? He says, what to salat in the hadith of the Prophet, وسلم, which is the hadith of Umar ibn al Khattab, which is the second hadith that Imam Nawi we places in 40 hadith, also is also known as the hadith of what he called Umm Sunnah. In this hadith, Jibril asked him the following questions, and he asked him, uh, What is Islam? And Islam. And he said, Islam is in what? And took me I mean, Islam is in. And Muhammad Rasulullah So when he says here what to to establish the prayer, the Sheikh said mean to add this salawat al al So this means to fulfill the obligation of the prayer. All right, those things which are obligatory, compulsory, meaning you don't have a decision in the matter. It's not when you feel like it. It's not if you up to it. It's not when you in the mood. It's not if it tickles your fancy. And you have no say so whatsoever. Do you understand this? Sometimes we think that we do. You don't. The obligatory prayer, you don't have no say so. The Prophet Sallallahu went so far to say, if you cannot pray standing, then pray doing what? Sitting down. If you cannot pray sitting down, then what do you say? Pray lying down. And if you cannot pray lying down, then what do you say? Pray with your eyes under no circumstances will you have the opportunity or the choice in the matter, all right? And if you leave off the prayer, then know that you left off the prayer either for multiple different reasons, but they all going to fall back on the blame of you and not the blame, not the other way around. It's not going to go back on the lies of what you're yelling. So if it's going to go on you, either you left it off out of negligence, either you left it off out of laziness, either you left it off out of... um um. Uh, heedlessness or you left it off out of anything this is why sometimes guarding the prayer means to make sure you guard whatever you need to guard in order so that the prayer can be intact so if you know staying up all night is going to um, run the, the possibility that you're not going to make fudger on time then now you got to guard that time so that you don't miss fudger you see that now now you have to gauge that time because if you know you're not going to get up for Fajr but you stayed up all night, then now you got to guard that time. So it's either you stay up and continue to you pray Fajr and go to sleep or, the, or you go to sleep early setting that time and that alarm. So all of this falls under that, right? Okay, so he says here, he says it means to carry it out night and day. He says, so what is the meaning to establish it? 
Okay? Uh, because the Prophet ﷺ did not say in his hadith, he did not say, he did not say, um, uh, and that you pray. The Prophet ﷺ didn't say that you pray, he said that you establish it. Two different things here. The Shaykh is pointing our attention to the fact that the wording of the Prophet ﷺ, and this is, this is why it's important too, um, and it's not the time to do that, and I do want to mention this. May Allah reward every brother, I mean, wallahi, everyone that's in the, in the arena of da'wah, that are sincere to Allah Azza wa Jal, that are calling to Allah, and that Allah allowed them to reach whatever level they can reach in Islam. Those who are taking the media platform, those who are taking the masajids, those who are teaching in the, uh, the madaris, those who are teaching in the colleges, the schools. May Allah reward you all. So this is not just a shot. But I really want you to be reminded of this. All of us, no matter what level you reach, Allah is only worrying about one thing. That is your taqwa. Your taqwa is going to be seen in your tatbiq. Do you understand? And your implementation of what you got. Whatever fadl he gave you, your implementation of it is what Allah is worrying about. That's your taqwa. Okay? And how well you implement that thing is based off your comprehension. That's your fiqh. That's what Allah has given you. Okay? So when an individual, just because you can talk and you can pronounce the Arabic so crisp or you can recite the ayat so good, come up with it. That's not the amazing thing. All right? The amazing thing with Allah, because Allah says, Inna akramakum atqaqum. Indeed, the most honorable, the most noble you are in the sight of Allah is those who fear Allah the most. Allah said, فَلَا تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not ascribe purity to yourselves. Allah knows best who those who fear Him the most. That's the... That's the nutshells. As the hadith of Abu Huraira comes in, um, um, it comes in the chapter of sincerity in Iman uh, al Salihin. That he says what? What did he say? He says that Rally Allah Jalla wa Allah does not look at what? He doesn't look at your body or, or your clothing. He look at your amal. Okay? He look at your actions. He look at your niya and your intentions. Okay? So these are the things we really want to worry about. Okay? So you can, you can flip your collar down. All right, you can put a little hit on your pen. And you ain't got to make it where as though every love you're giving, you're taking shots at other people. They can't do this, they can't do that. That's not what it's about. Teach the people what you have. Teach your family, teach yourself, and benefit. That's what you do. Pay attention to this here. He's, he, he's giving us a beautiful point here because he's saying that uh, when it comes to tukim or salat, all right, establishing the prayer, what it allows a person to do is allows a person that even you have to pay attention to the wording because... Sometimes we read hadith at face value. And if we don't know, and that's in English, and that's a translation of the understanding of the interpreter of that particular text, by the way. But anyway, even if you read the hadith and you don't know Arabic and stuff like that, you don't know the wording there. That wording plays a, a uh, uh, um, important role in the understanding of that hadith. So that's why here the, the Sheikh is pointing this out. He's saying that iqamatu salat. He says that the, he says the purpose or the objective or the aim of establishing the prayer is not just to perform it physically, not just the mirror image of it. That's not what it is. I perform the ruku, the bowling, I perform the uh, qiyam, the standing, I perform the raising of the hands. That's not what it is. That's not ikama to salat. All right, he's saying that's not what's understood or what's intended. Now, this is important here, right? And I want to point this out. He says that establishing the prayer means to perform it in the manner and the way that it was instituted, the way that it was, the way that the Prophet came with it, instructed. He said, this is based off the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. And by the way, when the Prophet ﷺ made this statement, he was actually standing on the member. Well, I mean, he came down from the member and he actually performed the prayer in front of the people. Because Jibril showed him how to pray. And he showed the ummah, his companions, how to pray. So he didn't just state it. He says, Sallu kama usalli. Pray like you just seen me pray. Perform the prayer just like you seen me pray. This part of the hadith, or this part of the statement of the shaykh, is showing us... In this hadith is showing us that what? Prayer comes with seeking ilm. Because now you have to have knowledge about what you're doing in your prayer. Allah Jalla wa'ala would tell the believers in the Quran, He would tell them, Wala taqurabu salata wa antum sukara. Huh? Hatta ta'lamu ma taqulu. Al-ayah. 
And this is the second verse that deals with the impermissible, uh, before Allah has made the Qamr become impermissible totally. All right? Because they, a lot of them were still was intoxicant, intoxicated, and then they were coming to the prayer and mix up the words and, and so forth like that. So this was the second verse. The first verse was in Barqa. The second verse here is in Surah Nisa. And then the third verse came in Surah Ma'idah. But these were in different time periods, by the way. They're not what they weren't just back to back, but they were in different time periods. So here Allah Jalla says, Oh, you who believe, do not come near to the do not approach the prayer. Do not come near to the prayer while you are intoxicated. Alright? And you until you know what you are saying. You should have knowledge of what you're saying in your prayer. So if you if if if, if talib or ilm is something that you won't, don't want to do as a profession or as a career, let best, no problem. But talib or ilm, when learning about how to worship your Lord, when it comes to the prayer, you have to be a talib or ilm. You have to be a talib or ilm when it comes to learning how to pray because you have to know exactly how to perform the prayer. Because he says, Sallu kama Pray as you see me pray. How would you know that? If you didn't study anything how the Prophet ﷺ prayed or how he performed prayer, was considered to be something that is an oblig obligatory in the prayer, was considered to be something that is a pillar in the prayer, that's, that's an eternal part of the prayer, that if you remove that part, the prayer doesn't stand. What's considered to be those things are prerequisites that comes before the prayer can be established and which those things which are, um, these things are very paramount. So you have to take your time out to study that. If you don't, you have to take your time out. Just like these two things go hand in hand that some people miss. To understand the five pillars of Islam, a lot of people believe that the five pillars of Islam, okay, we, we know what they is. The Shahada, the Salat, the fasting in the month of Ramadan, the giving zakat if you have it, or the making hajj, right? So we say this, but you don't even know that there is an order to the five, to the five pillars. And even though many different ahadiths mention the order, some of them are different, like sometimes the hadith, one hadith might mention the zakat before the fasting, and other hadith might mention the fasting before the zakat. But guess what never changed in the order? The first two. The shahada never comes, the salat never comes before the shahada. Never. You will not find one hadith where the Prophet mentioned about the five pillars now, where he would mention the salat before the shahada. Do you understand this? This order is there. And many of the scholars who explain this hadith, they explain to us a beautiful point, and I'm going to share it with y'all, inshallah ta'ala, because it was a benefit to me when I came across it. And that is because the shahada is your foundation. And the actualization of your foundation, the fact that you get it, that you understand the shahada, the fact that you believe in the shahada, is going to be proven in your salat. You see that? And in your fasting. And in your giving zakat. And in your making hajj. All of these are actualizations of the shahada. When you do them, you are attesting to what you say you believe in. But the salat comes afterwards. Because after you have the foundation, the belief in your heart, then you need to make that connection with your Lord. You cannot afford to lose that connection. You lose that connection, you lose your Islam. Umar ibn al-Qattab who was stabbed in the prayer. You understand that? He was stabbed by one of the fire worshippers um, that stabbed him. He wasn't a Muslim. And he was still concerned about the prayer. He still was concerned. As he was on his deathbed, so to speak, dying out, bleeding profusely, he was worried about the prayer. Do you understand this? Because he says, whoever leaves off the prayer has no portion. He has no portion in Islam. You get that? There's no portion. I don't care if you run around and call yourself Muslim, whatever you want. You have no portion. This is how the Sahabas understood it. You have to pray. And prayer plays a part in your belief in Allah. You say you believe in Allah, I don't have to follow you around. I don't have to be a cop. I don't have to be in your house. I don't have to say, oh, you praying and I don't have to see you at the masjid. Pray. No matter wherever you at, pray your salat. That's your connection. That's your actualization of your shahada. The covenant between us and them. Those two hadiths I mentioned earlier are, tar are paramount because those two hadiths are crucial. Make sure you guard your prayer, man. This hustle and bustle to and fro we got to separate ourselves from the animals. We have to make sure we pray, man. We're out there, deli. We move about. We might do this, do that. We're not going to do everything 100, 100. Some of us ride around. We got, 
you know what I mean? We're we taking it with the music, we're taking it with the, the lifestyle, we're taking it with this, we're taking that. We're having a little bit of fun. So we're going here, we're going to the beaches, we're going out, we're taking the kids out. And life goes on, the hustle and bustle. But guess what those five times out of a day does? It stops us. It shows us that we have a purpose, that we were here for a purpose. It shows us that we have direction, that we have aim, we have somewhere to go, that we're going somewhere, that there is a destination. It shows us that all of this that we see is not here for nothing. It shows us that. That's what those five times a day gives us. It gives us that joy. You know the relief you get when you know you prayed your five? If you didn't do nothing all day throughout the day and you know that you performed Fudger, Lohr, also. Maghrib and Isha, you perform all five of your prayers. You know how you feel? You feel actually, you should feel this way. If not, then there's something wrong. But you should feel, you know, an increase and a boost in your Iman. Because you were connected to your Lord five times a day. Not because just it was an obligation, it's because that connection was paramount for you to need. And that's something that we want to say. Last but not least, he, 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 fin he finished it up here. He says, he says, فَلَدِي رَوَاهُ بِعَيْنِهِ يُقْتَدَى بِهِ so he says, for those who were there present during the time that this hadith was actually stated and the Prophet ﷺ coined it, then they was able to take from the Prophet ﷺ directly and they was able to follow his example directly. He says, um, So he says, that's for those talking about us now because really we weren't there when the Prophet ﷺ said this hadith and he performed the prayer. So for those who are informed about what he said in authenticated ahadiths, then we have to base our prayer off the, those authenticated ahadiths. That's what he's saying. That has been conveyed. All right? He said, He says, so, this is from establishing the prayer and to perform the prayer in the manner in which the Prophet ﷺ will carry out the actual prayer command. Minha, meaning we don't take from it, nor do we, we don't add anything to it, nor do we subtract from it. He said, Also from a part establishing the prayer is the time that you pray. Now this is important because when it comes to obligatory prayers, there is there's a time. There's a time that it comes in, there's a time that it, it exit out. And that's why sometimes, actually, there are there are eyes on this. Anyway, actually, wise, and the companions of me statements about this. And I feel like I feel because I've been there, I know there are eyes on this. Anyway, actually, wise, and the companions of me statements about this. And I feel I feel because I know. I, can, I fall short a lot. So we have to really pay attention to this. The time limit plays a part with Nifak. When you don't guard the time limit, you, you know, this is the sign of hypocrisy. This is what the hypocrites do. Allah says, but either calm or calm or salat. All right? Well, and when they stand up for prayer, they stand up what? As kusala, to lazy, raw and nas, to be seen of men. You understand? But when it comes to that time, as Allah Jalla wa Ala says about in Surah Ta'am, um, I think Surah Ma'un. Allah mentioned, وَوَيْلُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ أَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاءُونَ All right? In these verses, uh, um, Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he mentioned about these verses, he says, when, he says, way, so woe, for وَيْلُ الْمُصَلِّينَ Woe to those who pray. The companions was like, woe. Some of the, some of the scholars, they say that it meant like a volley in the hellfire, but they say, woe. Allah said, woe to those who pray. Why would he say woe to those who pray? Meaning those who pray the prayer outside of his proper times. Those who delay the prayer for no legitimate re excuse, I mean, legitimate reason whatsoever. They just delay the prayer. So that's what Allah was saying, woe to those. So the time that for the obligatory prayers is set. Me and you don't set them. We have to have legal excuses bounding within the Sharia ah to not pray them on their proper times. And we ask Allah to make us all get better with it. I mean, it says, the ayat in the Quran, Allah Jalla says in Surah Al-Nisa, Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitaban mawquta. Allah said, indeed, we have decreed or prescribed for the believers a set fixed time, a state fixed time, right? Fixed stated time, rather. فَلَا يَخْرُجُهَا عَنْ وَقْتِهَا So it's, it's not permissible for us to pray it outside of his, uh, its fixed time. لِيَنَا مَقْسُودَ عَنْ يُسَلِّ كَمَا أَمْرُهُ اللَّهِ because the objective is to pray as Allah Jalla Allah commanded us to. Wallahu amraka an tusalli salatu fi waqtiha. And Allah have commanded us to perform the prayer in His time. We call the su'il al-Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ayu a'ma la ahbu ila Allah. And indeed, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked, "What is the uh, what actions or what from the deeds are the most beloved to Allah?" Fakal he responds, "As salatu li waqtiha." He says to perform the prayer in His time. Amma man yatasarrafu wa yusalli ala hawa 
متى ما أراد ومتى ما قام من نومه أو فرق من شغله فهذا صلاة غير صحيحة. So the Sheikh he says, as for the individual who, يعني performs the prayer according to his or her desires. In other words, okay, I perform it when I want. Okay, or I stand for my prayer when, when I, I mean when I wake up from sleep. When I wake up from sleep, then I perform it. Or when I get a, a a little bit of free time from the time when I'm preoccupied or busy, right? He said, "Fahad salatu wa ghayr sahiha." He said that this person's prayer is not correct. Liyanahu lam yusalli salat alati amal Allahu biya because he did not perform the prayer as Allah Jalla wa Ala commanded him to. Wa inna ma salla salat salatan ala hasbi hawa. Rather, he performed the prayer or she performed the prayer in the manner that is uh, to their desires. In other words, he says, "Wa kadali kamini qamat salat." Also, from establishing the prayer. So let's get this right. Establishing the prayer is to what? Pray it like the Prophet ﷺ instructed us to pray. That means know his pillars, his wadi back, so forth, etc. Right? Then he says also from establishing salat, it means we pray according to the times because they have set limits. All right? We're talking about the obligatory prayers here. Then he said, thirdly, from establishing the salat is khushu'u fiha. This is the heart of the prayer. Everyone, this is a rhetorical question. You know yourself better than Allah Jalala know you. Allah know you better than you know yourself, and you know yourself better than anyone else. This is a rhetorical question. When you perform the prayer, you should know what state you are when you're performing the prayer. Your khushur is the heart. It is the essence of the prayer. Do you understand this? Allah Jalla describes the believers that they pray with the khushur. You understand that they have this khushur. All right? The Sheikh, he says, khushur contains wa huduru qalb. When they say huduru qalb, meaning your heart must be attentive. In other words, you, you should be aware, you should be conniving, not just mentally, okay, but physically, spiritually, all of that, all of the above, you should be in tune that you're praying to Allah. Pay attention to what he's saying. He says, so for the one who performed the prayer just with his body, he just came to pray and he just praying physically. He says, however, his or her heart is absent, is heedless, okay, during this prayer. He said, then he would not get any reward for his prayer except which he is conniging of. So that's with that which he's aware of in the prayer. Whatever portion of the prayer that he's heedless of or she's heedless of, they don't get the reward for that. Only what they are conniging of, all right? He says, Allah says in the Quran, called the aflah al-mu'minun, indeed the believers are successful. And this is another it's not time to go into that. Allah Jalla wa'ala said called the aflaha. And when he used the qad here, he used for something that's past tense. I'm not going to go into that, but that's a beautiful benefit right there. Um, anyway, Alladina hum fi salatihim khashi'un. Those who in their prayers, they have khashiyah. Okay, they have khushur. Wa qala wa innaha la kabiratun illa ala khashi'in. And Allah said, indeed, the burden of the prayer, the prayer itself, it's only extremely difficult except for those who have khashiyah. Those who have khushur, they don't find it to be a burden. They don't find it to be difficult. And sometimes we gotta fight with our nafs because we don't wanna be honest with ourselves. Every time we partake in the sins that we like to partake in, and we're going to do it, it's killing us. Do you understand that? It is fighting with the righteousness of ourselves. Do you not understand that? Your performance of righteousness is always going to be tainted it's always going to be harmed. It's always going to be deficient based off the simple fact of your enjoyment of your desires. I want you to know the two, the two. And I understand this. So whenever I want to take that leisure time, and whenever I want to take that time to, you know, bob my head or sit there and do this that I know I shouldn't be doing, I'm harming the performance of my righteous actions. Because I'm not going to be able to perform my righteous actions to its top duty because I just partaken in what I partaken in. What's my proof? The Prophet ﷺ mentioned, pay attention now, because he mentioned this, that what? That the prayer, whoever performed the night prayer, now look what he said. Whoever prays the night prayer and he perform a hundred ayats, he recites a hundred ayats, he be written down with the muhsineen. And he mentioned 60 ayats and he mentioned more than that. But he based these fuddles and these actions off of who? The individual who what? Who offered the salat. And it was mentioned from the scholars of the past that the person could not make the night prayer. He said, that's because you have to leave off sins and disobedience. That's what's preventing you from making the night prayer. So whenever we enjoy ourselves, because that's what it is. When you want to take that leisure, we have to realize this. 
we are suffering something, something else is being, uh, uh, something else is being harmed here. That's the performance of your actions. Whenever you find yourself deficient in any action, notice it's because the enjoyment that you have taken. Make the connection between the two. Alhamdulillah, you'll be upon a lot of car. You'll be upon a lot of good, and may Allah Jawala grant you the toe feet to overcome your desires. That's why we always got to ask Allah to give us the strength to overcome our desires. Because no matter who we are, we're going to be tested and try. And the more that we do know, the more we're going to be tested. That's just how Allah Jalla works. And that's how the Prophet ﷺ has laid it down in the authenticated hadith. Last but not least, he says here, he says, um, يعني that the salat is a burden and is hard and is heavy only upon those who have khashiyah. He says, why? Because the people who have khashiyah, they are the individuals who see the carrying out this obligation of prayer to be easy. They see it to be easy. They don't see it to be difficult. They see it to be easy. And they take enjoyment in it. They enjoy praying. How many of us can say that we enjoy praying? I'm talking about not when we're in the mood. Like, come on, let's, let's, let's stop playing. Not when we're in the mood. Not when we, you know, we look up. We got five grand in our bank account. We got a new job. We just got the woman that we wanted. We just got the man that we wanted to get married. Or we just get in the house. Not all of that. Not when something good happened to you. Then you praying. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, or now you all good. No. How many of us take enjoyment? How many take enjoyment with the prayer? This is what he said. He said, well, khushu'a ruhu salat. Didn't I just say that earlier? He said that the khushur is the ruhu salat. It is the essence of the prayer. You understand? The ulama, they argue that a person who doesn't have khushur, this is why they say khushur is from the pillars, by the way. They say khushur is from the pillars. I mean, it's a different opinion among scholars. But they say khushur is from the pillars. And that if you remove the khushur, the prayer is not even accepted. Do you understand that? Khushur is the essence of the prayer. It is said, وَالصَّلَاةُ بِلَا خُشُورٍ بِلَا خُشُورٍ تَجَسَدٍ بِلَا رُوحٌ They said that a prayer without khushur is like a body without a spirit. وَإِنْ كَانَ قَدَ صَلَّ فِي الظَّاهِرِ وَلَا يُؤْمَرُ بِالْعِعَادَ لَكِنْ لَيْسَ لَهُ فِيهَا ثَوَابٍ He said, and if the person was to perform the prayer outwardly, يعني, and even though he's not commanded to repeat the prayer, okay, However, he do not get, he or she would not get no reward for that prayer if they don't have no khushur. And when he exit from that prayer, or when she exit from that prayer, they exit without any reward whatsoever in the prayer. Because their heart was not present from the beginning of it to the end of it. He says. Uh, and they have left with it with a little bit of benefit they might have taken from it. He said, Or it's possible they could have left with a lot of benefit from it. Or it's possible a person could leave the prayer with complete benefit, and that's the person who prays with Kushur. He says, well, All of this, anyway, is going to be based off the extent of the person Kushur in the prayer, Allahu Akbar. And then he says at the end, he says also from establishing the prayer, and it's really more so to the men and not the women, he says, is salatuha fil masajid ma'al jama'a. Alhamdulillah, the masajids are starting to open back up now. I know they're getting ready to close um, Pennsylvania back down again uh, with the, um, the numbers of the cases rising, but the masajids are starting to open up. Their schedules are being done. Uh, their social distance. And I know this is a lot of uh, big arguments back and forth. I had somebody come in my inbox several times um, about, uh, you know, I just want to advise people, man. We're not scholars, all right? And I say, I say that really so that we can know our place. Okay, if you don't like a certain ruling, you don't agree with a certain ruling, let pass, right? But you have to make sure you're, don't, you're not liking that ruling, you're not agreeing that ruling because you understand the mas'ala, the issue. You understand the evidence that are being presented. You understanding the ijtihad that's being devised. You understanding the conclusion that's being drawn. If you don't have expertise in that, then really your opinion doesn't matter. Do you understand that? Your opinion really doesn't matter in this case because you are really moving off emotions, more so moving off our ilm. Do you understand? So now, another thing you have to take in consideration. Scholars are under the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that if they make an ishtihad that is incorrect, they still get a reward. Do you know that? And if they make an ishtihad that is correct, they get two rewards. So they're already covered. 
you're not covered. So for me to sit here and go back and forth with you, whether or not you believe that we should pray with gaps or social distancing and a scholar who says X, Y, and Z, whether we should do that, I don't got time to go back and forth with you on that. I really don't. And at the end of the day, if you're not a person who don't have a masjid, this is not your concern. You're not over nobody. You're not telling people how to pray. You are praying in your home. If you want to pray with your wife, if you have a wife, then you can pray side to side, not best. You can pray with her behind or side to side because it's different opinions with that. Right? So you, as Sheikh Sholei Fazan mentioned, he said both of them are correct. The woman can pray side to side with her husband or she can pray behind him. Both are kilahu masahih. He said both of them are correct. Okay, he didn't bring his, he didn't mention the actual proof, but alhamdulillah, we think good of the shaykh, and we just say, okay, we go back until we investigate the, the evidence, and we see what it is. We don't want to work with that. You want to pray with behind you, let us. But like I'm saying to you, at the end of the day, it's nothing for me and you to go back and forth about you don't like the fact that we're praying with gaps and social distancing. Okay, you don't like it. Look what Sheikh uh, Suleiman al-Ruhayli, Hafizullah, look what he said when he was talking about this issue. Just look at the mannerism of the scholars. This sheikh, he said, there are scholars who actually says, and they bring ijtihad and proofs for reason of social distancing and for this time to call for you can pray with gaps, right? And then there are scholars who do not do this. Do you understand? But if us being muqalidun, because that's what we are, we are muqalidun, we're blind followers at, certain, uh, at a certain level because we don't have the tools to go in and make ijtihad ourselves. Do you understand? So in that case, whatever scholar that you agree with that actually moves to your heart with their evidence and their proof and you trust, then that's what you ride with. You say, okay, this scholar, okay, alhamdulillah, that truth seems to be this and that, and that's close, then you ride with that. You don't have to go around making in call. You don't have to put up memes. You don't have to be under people, you have to be people in boxes, you don't have to be people in comment sections. Yeah, I'm telling you that's wrong. You can't pray with your this, this, that. You don't have to. Initially, when we, we, we first hear about it, yeah, Sheikh Abdul Muslim spoke against this. It's not from the Sunnah to pray like that. Yes. Then there's other scholars who came with it. And I remember we actually came out and said, listen, going with the position of Sheikh Abdul Muslim and making it that this is something that we don't know. Then there's other scholars who came with other points. But we all can stand corrected at some time. You understand? So it's nothing for us to split hairs. So, you know, this issue of social distancing right now, I just wanted to, to bring it up because I know in the Salats and Jumu'ah right now, there are practices limited in social distance and things like that because they're still taking the virus to be very real. And we still respect our scholars, man. It's still a part of ihtiram. You didn't put in that work. So stop acting like you put in that work to learn the information that you need to learn. You're probably struggling. All of us are struggling to understand these issues or understand these texts. And we're dealing with certain things, so we have to actually give it. I'm almost done. Yubi, this is the end of it right here. He says at the end, he says... So he says that the praying in the Jama'ah congregation, the Jama'ah Tawajib al Ayan, Yani al Ashkas, but Kulu Muslim Yakdaru al Huduru Masjid was Salati Ma'a Jama'ah Yajibu Ali Alayhi Dal. So he said, actually, he's bringing a beautiful point here. He said, the obligation only holds true for those who are under the, uh, in, it's an individual obligation uh, for those that only hold truth, it's an individual obligation that only holds truth for those who are under the, um, that obligation, meaning the men here. He's talking about the men. He's not talking about the woman. He's talking about the men. And the deen and in the uh, Quran and in, uh, in, in the Sunnah, it actually mentioned that the obligation and congregation are for the men and not the woman. This does not mean that the woman cannot go. All right? The Prophet Sallam actually said, if the woman wants to go, you do not prevent her from going. Okay? All right? You do not prevent her from going if she wants to go. But it's not obligatory that she prays in congregation. She can pray in her home. All right. Actually, the hadith mentioned that it's the best place for her to pray in the remote part of our home. All right, um, which is also showing a lot of a lot of signs of femininity. And I think a lot of, especially in this time, the twenty first century is worse, man. They, they they did doing a number on all of the sexes right now. If you don't believe it, it is a war against the sexes. I don't care how you want to put it. The genders is a war because they're making us think that uh, for for some reason everyone is just a kind of dis discombobulated here. So it's like, are you can you shut that, please? It's like everyone is discombobulated here. All right. All right. Everyone is discombobulated. In other words, they're messing with the genders. They're making it seem it's like you're weak if you behave in this way or you're being this way if you behave that way. And it's all like a psychological warfare or concept. But if you, you have to realize something here, you submit to who? Allah. And your prayer is going to be that integral part that says that you do that. So if you're a person who guards your prayer, and you pray five times a day, and you have shahada, and you actualize in your salat, then you submit to what Allah says. 
So if Allah says a woman should behave this way and a man should behave this way, that's the rule. If Allah says that, that's the rule. Not what someone say from a secular... <laughs> A secular point of view or someone say some political party or some actual movement, feminist movement. None of that don't mean that. Your femininity is going to be displayed within your um, um, actualizing and accentuating those features which Allah have given you. The beard is for the men. This is a part of a man's masculinity. Do you not understand that? The creator actually recognized the sheriff. Okay, he exercised the honor of the beard for the men. And he understands this is a part of masculinity. So for a woman, from her greatest weapons that she had is, is her femininity. She loses that when she steps outside of that room. You understand? And it's so easy to do that. Because when you're always on the forefront, you understand? And you don't like to pray in your house, in the remote part of your house. You don't like to cover and wear the jilbab. You don't like to submit to Allah's text. Then you are putting yourself out there boldly and you are running the risk. And you know what I'm talking about. And it's true. You are running the risk of what? Losing your femininity. You're becoming more masculine than you know. More masculine. Your children can see it. And if you marry, the husband can actually see it. You probably acting like you can't see it, but you have some women, and I ain't gonna say some, I'm just being a little modest here, but you got a lot of women, man, that's more, more tough than men. I mean, I ain't even talking about in just other areas that might be permissible for them to be tough, tough than men, because women can take a lot other than men have. Allah Jalla says, well, he said, and that the male is not like the female, all right? So there are certain things that the woman definitely can take. She can bear childbirth. We men, we can't do that. The woman can take a lot of other things that the men cannot take. I'm not talking about those permissible things, but I'm saying other areas that you don't have to take on, you lose a lot of that. So you find yourself really just mad and going back and forth with the guy on. You, he don't even, you and him really don't even know why y'all fighting over who wear the pants. It's supposed to be outwardly you saying, yeah, he wear the pants, but your actions are saying, no, he don't wear the pants. I wear the pants. This is the way it's supposed to be done, right? And it don't make you back stone age because you allow that man to move forward. And it doesn't mean because that man is actually moving forward that you cannot give your input. Islam doesn't encourage that. Well, you get that from the Prophet ﷺ consulted it with his wives. Multiple of them, not just one wife. He consulted it with his wives. He, he short their opinion. He valued their opinion. So we can't say that a woman can't give her husband advice. She can't encourage him. And a woman can be smarter in men in multiple ways. And that's, that's, true, and that's, true, and that's, that's something that's shown. So I didn't really want to take the time just to go into that. But I want you to be aware of certain things that are being put out there that are making us lose our femininity. And a woman praying in our home, in a remote place of our home, is a sign of her iman. And notice something. It's also a sign of her hayat, of her shyness. Allahu Akbar. And it also is a sign of her uh, femininity. Last but not least, he mentioned this at the end. He says, so... Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, "Men semi an nida'a, falam yujib, fala salatullahu illa iman min uzur." The Prophet ﷺ said, "Whoever hears the nida'a, another word for the adhan, then um, he doesn't answer or he doesn't respond. He doesn't reply, respond to that call. He said, then there is no prayer for him except for the one who has a legal excuse." All right. He says, "Walla uh, ukana kulu wahid in yusalli fi makanihi aw fi baiti limada shudir adhan." So now the Sheikh brings a irrational point here. He says, "So if everyone was to pray in their home, right?" Or he says, if everyone was to pray in their place, whether they place a residence, they place a work, or they place, or their home, right? He says, then what will be, what's the point of legislating the Adan? What will be the Adan for? There won't be no point for the Adan, right? And the Adan is a hayya ala salat, hayya ala al -fala. What would be the reason for the Mu'adda saying all of that? If we all just pray in our place in our home. The Adan is so that you come to congregational prayer, correct? That's the point he's trying to make. He says, Ya'ni uh, ta'alu sallu ma jama' fi buyutillah. Come out and pray in congregation in the houses of Allah. Illa man kan except for the one who has a legitimate excuse. Aulaysa and the or one who doesn't have a congregation to go to. Aulaysa and the masjid, or one who doesn't have a masjid to go to. For you sali fi makani, then he will pray in his place. Amma ladi hawla masjid wa yasma adhan wa huwa ma'afa wa amina wa aminun wa amanun wa amanun. Fala salata lahu ida salla fi baytihi. Allahu akbar. And that's the end. He says that as for the one who lives around or Mashid is around the area that he lives at um, and he, he can hear the Adan being called, 
while he is actually okay, so to speak. He's actually okay. He's actually okay. And he's in safety. Okay, he's safety. Meaning that he can move to and fro and nothing's going to happen to him. He says then, Then there's no uh, uh, um, reward for his prayer if he just, um, when he prays in his home. Because it's obligatory. He have all the conditions there that's available for him to go pray. So we ask Allah Jalla Wala to make us be of those who guard our prayers. Thank y'all for um, tuning in and staying in, inshallah ta'ala. I ask you, to, um, we ask Allah Jalla to forgive us for all our shortcomings because we fall short daily on a, on a daily basis. We ask Allah Jalla Wala to allow us to slay our father while we're still alive. We ask Allah Jalla Wala to allow us to really guard and preserve our prayers. Uh, allow us to be less judgmental of others but more judgmental of ourselves. We ask Allah Jalla Wala to allow us to be an example to ourselves and then to everyone else around us, starting with our houses and our homes. Our homes. They should see you pray. If that child don't see you do anything, that child should see you praying. If that woman don't see you do anything, she should see you praying. If that man don't see you do anything, he should see you praying. Everyone should bear witness to the fact that you always are connected to your Lord. This is something that is important. We ask Allah Jalla Wala to allow us to really actualize our Tawheed and our Shahada and to forgive us for every shortcoming that we have and that he uh, make us uh, a bit us into the paradise that he has promised us on the tongue of his messengers. And we ask Allah Jalla Wala to allow us to die upon Islam. Whatever we said that was incorrect in this talk. I said for myself, the shaitan, whatever we said is correct from Allah Jalla Wala. Subhanakallahum, your hamdi, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiru wa tuwilib jazakallah khan.